Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. We're finally back talking about history once again. We're completely done with the first half of the 20th century, and we're now moving into the 1960s and all of the wonderful events that took place in China during that period. Today we're going to be covering the Sino-Soviet split, which unfolded over several years between around 1958 to 1964. The breakdown in relations between the two largest communist countries is something that we kind of all take as a given now, but we don't often talk about what exactly it was, why it was important at the time, and what it meant not just for communist politics, but for global politics generally. The Sino-Soviet split is probably best understood as a slow crash and burn in an increasingly tense relationship followed by a messy divorce and several ugly custody battles. While it's probably not that widely understood, it's an extremely important event in Cold War history. In his 2011 book, The Sino-Soviet Split, The Cold War in the Communist World, Lorenz Luthi outlines its significance as follows. Quote, The Sino-Soviet Split was one of the key events of the Cold War, equal in importance to the construction of the Berlin Wall, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Second Vietnam War, and Sino-American Rapprochement. The split helped to determine the framework of the second half of the Cold War in general, and influenced the course of the Second Vietnam War in particular. Access to archives from both countries has allowed for an expanded understanding of what exactly happened that led to the breakdown, and tend to show that China was the lead antagonist in the situation, mainly as a result of its own domestic politics. They were the spouse that filed for divorce, essentially, more due to their own issues than any overt wrongdoing by the other party. We'll be covering these events in detail over the course of the next two episodes, and hopefully it will provide a solid background for discussions about China's international politics in future episodes as well. Now, I just want to say that These two episodes have been relatively difficult to put together, not because we don't know what the causes of the Sino-Soviet split were or what happened, if anything we know all too well. Academics and interested parties have identified dozens of reasons for the split, falling into all categories from the political to the economic to the downright personal. But even though we know what happened, the problem is identifying exactly why it happened. Why did things have to fall apart the way they did? You see, academics like neat little theories to wrap up all of their discoveries in. We can trace the ascendancy of the CCP to the specific failures of the KMT's attempts to reunify the country and install a stable government. We know that the CCP pursued the five-year plan model because they were relying on the Soviet model of development to propel their own growth, And we know that the Great Leap Forward was a radical attempt by Mao to distance China from post-Stalin USSR and overcome critics of his regime by proving that China could, in fact, achieve full communism despite the lack of material abundance identified as necessary by traditional communist thought. But the Sino-Soviet split is a lot messier. It's missing that sexy, overarching theory that links together all of the individual occurrences and identifies a background or coherent theme or message or something that would just make us all feel a little bit more comfortable. There are, of course, theories out there. There's the divulging national interest theory, ideological divergence theory, the ambitious China theory, all of which go some way to explaining some of the reasons, but again, that fail to link them all together in a satisfying way. A structural approach works a bit better, because it argues that the Soviet Union was basically trying to retain hegemony at the top of the communist world, which naturally led to ruptures and conflicts when other countries tried to prioritise their own national interests. But, as one scholar puts it, this view treats those differences as given. It fails to give sufficient weight to human agency. It does not explain why, on numerous occasions, Differences within the socialist camp were relatively smoothly hammered out. So, what theory would give weight to all of these variables? One study, by Mingjian Li, posits the split as a result of an ideological dilemma that was manipulated by Mao into advancing his own domestic policies. 
In a 2011 article, he writes, quote, When ideological differences exist between two countries, political leaders in one are likely to regard the ideological and political orientation of the other as a challenge and even a threat to their own domestic ideological and political programs and goals. Any move that one side makes to defend its ideological and political position would be perceived by the other as a threat to the legitimacy of its own domestic political line and would invite criticism from the other side. Any step that the other side takes to either counter-argue or employ punitive actions against its rival would beget countermeasures. A vicious circle is thus formed. Factions in either country would be strongly tempted to use the ideological differences with the other country for their own domestic political purposes. In other words, the increasing radicalism of Maoist politics throughout the 1960s meant that a break with the Soviet Union, which was going through a revisionist period at the time, was almost inevitable. It was a reflection of Mao's struggles with more moderate leaders back home, who wanted to halt the revolution and his radical programs. I think this theory probably comes closest to being the all-encompassing model that historians especially would look for, and even offers an explanation for why Sino-Soviet relations seem to be declining rapidly at certain points, but then suddenly recovered at others. But I think it suffers from the same problem that most of the others do. Basically, these theories tend to be rather teleological. In other words, they try and superimpose post hoc reasoning on events that have already occurred in order to explain those events so that they make sense in a modern setting. You're essentially ascribing an explanation of something as a function of the final outcome. Hegel, for example, had a teleological view of history and saw the course of history as moving towards a particular end goal. Marx argues that history is on a particular trajectory and has been since the beginning of time, starting with primitive communism, then moving through slavery, feudalism and capitalism, and will eventually reach socialism and communism, all the while being pushed forward and determined by the material conditions of society through dialectical materialism. So these are examples of attempts to sum up history, and in some cases the future, of society in very neat, easily understandable ways, which don't always quite work out if you just observe how things are naturally playing out, or if you drill down into the nitty-gritty of a subject and really tease out everything that happened. So with all that said, what does this mean for the structure of the next two episodes? Well, it basically means that instead of trying to create this beautiful, interlocking series of events that end up giving a really pleasing conclusion where we round up and move on to the next thing, you're basically going to get a list of things that happened and just going to have to take it or leave it. I am going to try and divide these episodes into sections that represent the ebbs and flows of the relationship between the two nations. All the writings I've seen on the split divide it into chronological phases. So we're going to start with 1958 as a sort of background to the collapse in relations. Within each phase, there tend to be several events that take place, so I will do my best to explain what happens in each year as clearly as possible, and then try and sort of summarise what the overall effect of that year had on Sino-Soviet relations in the long term before moving on to the next year. So this episode will cover the years 1958 and 1959. Yes, I know it's only two years, but a lot happens. And then in the next episode, hopefully we can speed things up because we've got all of this context and we'll talk about 1960 to 1964 a bit more concisely. Okay, so let's start with 1958. As we already know, 1958 saw the launch of The Great Leap Forward. Mao's plan to launch China into full communism and create a self-sufficient society free from foreign influence. Though the two may not seem that related on the surface, the Great Leap Forward actually forms a crucial backdrop to the Sino-Soviet split for a number of reasons. Apart from being an economic movement, the Great Leap Forward was of course highly politicised, focusing on the themes of nationalism and the power of mass mobilisation to overcome material scarcity. It was a radicalization of domestic Chinese politics that promoted Mao's cult of personality to new heights and prevented his political dominance from being effectively challenged by his peers. 
It was also an attempt by Mao to move away from the Soviet-led development in terms of models and loans, especially in light of the disappointing results of the first five-year plan, which took place between 1953 and 1957, which had seen modest growth in the Chinese economy, but not so much that it could effectively challenge the West, which was Mao's ultimate goal. So the Great Leap Forward amounted to an ideological challenge of the USSR's leadership of the communist world, not because China was trying to surpass them necessarily, although some people do argue that that was also the case, but because it was a huge deviation from the theoretical line set by Moscow and a repetition of some of the past mistakes made by the Soviet Union under Stalin. These repetitions were somewhat deliberate, as Mao had rejected the new bureaucratic style of Soviet governance and had a personal dislike for Khrushchev, which becomes very important later. Whereas he had an open admiration for Stalin's revolutionary politics and his cult of personality. As such, China wanted to prove that it could succeed where the USSR had failed, based on embracing mass mobilisation and China's unique historical situation. A huge part of the Great Leap Forward rhetoric was an emphasis on the differences between China and the Soviet Union, and the need to move away from blindly following whatever the Soviet Union had done, from politics and economics to art and societal restructuring. So here's a quote that Mao gave in March 1958 regarding the Great Leap Forward. Quote, To import Soviet codes and conventions inflexibly is to lack the creative spirit. I couldn't have eggs or chicken soup for three years because an article appeared in the Soviet Union which said that one shouldn't eat them. Later, they said one could eat them. It didn't matter whether the article was correct or not. The Chinese listened all the same and respectfully obeyed. In short, the Soviet Union was tops. The greater part of the Soviet planning was correctly applied to China, but part of it was incorrect. It was imported uncritically. We understood still less the economic differences between the Soviet Union and China, so all we could do was follow blindly. Now the situation has changed. Generally speaking, we are now capable of undertaking the planning and construction of large enterprises. In another five years, we should be capable of manufacturing the equipment ourselves. End quote. So this quote not only reveals Mao's personal frustrations with how China had been, in his opinion, led a little bit astray by Soviet advice, but also how eager he was to sort of get China standing on its own two feet, instead of relying on imports and experts from the Soviet Union all the time. Despite these blatant challenges to the Soviet model, the Soviet Union's response to the Great Leap Forward was actually surprisingly muted at first. They didn't even want to translate the proper name of the leap into Russian for fear of callbacks to something called Stalin's Leap Forward, which took place in the 1930s. Khrushchev told Mao directly that he didn't think communes were a good idea, as they hadn't worked out in the Soviet Union, but again, he never publicly condemned the leap and kept his criticism private. The Soviet Union even wanted to keep up industrial and economic cooperation, promising to deliver 47 industrial projects to China in 1958 and another 78 in 1959. It seems then that Moscow's tactic was to treat China as delicately as possible, despite their deep understandings of the problems of agriculture that plagued China, of which they had intimate knowledge themselves. The Soviets even resisted pushing back against China's aggressive attitude towards perceived slights made by the Soviet Union during diplomatic discussions about shared facilities in Chinese territory and proposed military cooperation. This part began when the US had sent some intermediate range ballistic missiles, or IRBMs, to Britain, Italy and Turkey to boost its defence capabilities against the Soviet Union in 1958. This was on top of the tactical nuclear missiles they had stationed in Taiwan in 1957. In order to achieve what they had considered parity, the Soviets decided to deploy strategic submarines carrying nuclear missiles near points of US interest, which of course included along the Chinese coast. They also wanted to set up a radio transmission tower on Hainan Island, in the south of China, which they offered to pay most of the cost for, and which would be open to joint use with China. 
China was not happy with the Soviet plans, seeing them as an infringement on Chinese sovereignty instead of a chance to protect themselves from US imposition. They pushed back, saying that the USSR should only be allowed to use the radio tower during wartime, and in the future, the two parties should limit military relations to the delivery of samples from the USSR to China so that China could develop their own technology. Again here we see Mao's insistence that China be able to stand on its own two feet. The reaction to an idea of a Soviet fleet along China's coast was even worse, with Mao going as far as to threaten to organise guerrilla forces against their Soviet occupiers. The Chinese response probably wouldn't have been so intense if not for the heated domestic situation that was being whipped up as a result of the Great Leap Forward. Part of this was a reaction against perceived Soviet chauvinism, and also the fact that the Soviet Union was seemingly becoming softer in its dealings with the US, as Khrushchev had recently agreed with President Eisenhower on the need to moderate global nuclear policy. From Mao's point of view, the proposed joint fleet in the Taiwan Strait was just an attempt by Khrushchev to prevent any moves by the PRC against Taiwan, so as to further facilitate positive relations between the USSR and the US. Mao was not willing to let China be used as a pawn in anyone else's game, and the increasing tendency towards a policy of self-reliance fueled support for these ambitions domestically as well. I guess Mao didn't really take into consideration the fact that even though Khrushchev was trying to approach the US more delicately, they were still technically two nations at war. In order to try and fix this misunderstanding, from July 31st to August 3rd, Khrushchev made a low-profile visit to China to discuss joint ventures and military strategy moving forward. Apparently, a really funny scene occurs at some point where they both are discussing military tactics in a swimming pool, and famously, Mao is a very, very good swimmer. So he was, like, swimming laps around Khrushchev, who apparently couldn't swim and had to wear, like, a donut ring or something or a floaty to help him stay up and just like the mental image of these two like guys in their I think 60s at this point just floating around in the swimming pool talking about global politics is just really funny to me but anyway so after the four days they finally agreed to the building of this joint radio tower on Hainan but they didn't reach an agreement on the naval fleet Basically, uh, the Soviet Union took on all fault in this matter, stating that the ambassador had miscommunicated their intentions and that their side had generally been unprepared for negotiations. It was quite a surprising and unremarkable end to the matter, which seemed to capitulate everything in favour of the Chinese worldview. But this situation belied greater concerns which would come to the fore in the future. Despite the initial quiet reaction of the Soviet Union, the tension caused by Mao's policies and the radicalization of domestic Chinese politics would have two main consequences, those being the Second Taiwan Strait Crisis and the end of a proposed nuclear arms deal between China and the USSR. But before we talk about either of those, we should probably talk about Yugoslavia. In 1945, the People's Front, Yugoslavia's Communist Party, won an election in which they were the only running party and established the Federal People's Republic of Yugoslavia under Marshal Tito. Though the original Yugoslavian constitution was modelled on the Soviet Union's, Yugoslavia and the USSR underwent their own split in 1948, with Tito actively pulling away from Stalinist policies and pursuing neutrality with Western nations. Tito very rudely did not attend the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution in November 1957 in Moscow, though he did send a delegation whose main role was apparently to just listen and take detailed notes, because in March 1958 they released their own draft policy document that completely disagreed and clashed with what the major communist powers had agreed to at the anniversary celebrations. So Tito had basically put forward a plan to do his own thing in domestic affairs while seeking neutrality in international affairs, completely rejecting the idea of a Soviet-led communist bloc that all marched forward as one unit. 
Now, interestingly, just like its dealings with China's domestic politics, the Soviet Union seemed to take a relatively gentle approach with Yugoslavia, especially as the new policies could be considered a huge insult and possibly even a challenge to Soviet superiority. Despite giving a detailed critique of the policy document, the Soviet Union expressed that it would still remain friends with Yugoslavia, always, and continued normal diplomatic relations. Khrushchev even kindly continued to refer to Tito as comrade. China, however, took a completely different stance, openly criticising the revisionist policies of the Tito clique, and stating that Stalin's initial attacks against Yugoslavia in 1949 that had linked the country to US imperialism still stood the test of time. Yugoslavia subsequently withdrew its ambassador from China, signalling that a rapprochement would be very difficult, if not impossible. Okay, so tangent over, why is it important? So the difference in opinion and approach in dealing with Yugoslavia was a demonstration of the difference in mindset between Mao and Khrushchev. While Khrushchev was warming to the idea of a detente with the West, and so he basically supported Tito's attempts to do the same, Mao found this idea to be a complete aberration, and still viewed Western nations as imperialist invaders, whose interference in Chinese domestic policies and in East Asia in general as an affront to Chinese nationalism and autonomy. This difference in mindset was fundamental to why China handled the second Taiwanese Strait crisis the way it did, and why the relations between the two countries began to break down after this point. China was pretty much trying to announce that it was ready to take on the US if it came down to an all-out war, and again, this is all being bolstered by a heightened domestic politics surrounding nationalism and a need for China to assert itself against other nations that it sees as infringing on its territory. So, for example, in a speech at the Eighth Party Congress in May 1958, Mao said, quote, If the war maniacs use atom bombs, what is to be done? Let them use them. If we prepare, and if they really strike, what is to be done? We must talk about this problem. If they strike, then they strike. We will exterminate imperialism, and afterwards once again construct. If war breaks out, it is unavoidable that people will die. We've seen wars kill people. Many times in China's past, half the population has been wiped out. We have, at present, no experience with atomic war. We do not know how many must die. It is better if one half are left. The second best is one third. After several five-year plans, China will then develop and rise up. In place of the totally destroyed capitalism, we will obtain perpetual peace. This will not be a bad thing. Okay, so now we know exactly what Mao's mindset was going into this. So, let's talk about the Taiwan Strait crisis. In December 1957, Talks between the US and China regarding the PRC's legitimacy and rights to Taiwan had collapsed, as both sides refused to back down over the question of forces in the Taiwan Strait. As a result, at the beginning of 1958, Mao prepared to resume attacks on Taiwan, though he hadn't yet decided the exact timing or nature of the attacks at that time. This changed with the landing of US troops in Lebanon on July 14th, 1958, who had arrived to contain the rebellion in Iraq against the pro-Western leader King Faisal. Mao seized this opportunity to launch an anti-American campaign, using their support of the Middle Eastern freedom as an excuse to relaunch attacks on Taiwan. On July 17th, an article in the People's Daily ran, stating that if the American aggressors are permitted to do as they wish, then not only will the people of the Middle East be enslaved, but a new world war will be inevitable. Therefore, let the people of the world take emergency action. Mao vowed to support the Arab peoples by launching an attack on Chiang Kai-shek in order to contain US imperialism. Again, Khrushchev's response was quite different, reflective of the difference in mindset. Instead of basically declaring war, he wrote to Eisenhower to propose a summit of five countries, 
the US, Britain, India, France, and the Soviet Union to resolve the Middle East crisis peacefully. The US agreed, but they asked that the conference be held in the UN Security Council, in which China was represented by Taiwan at that time, and the PRC had not been recognised as a legitimate state. This exclusion angered Mao, and Khrushchev withdrew his agreement. A couple of weeks later, Khrushchev visited the PRC on his secret state visit, which seemed to calm things down on the surface, but clearly the Soviet leader had just been kept in the dark about what Mao was planning. Mao believed that Khrushchev was determined to follow a policy of appeasement with the US, which he simply could not accept, and added to this the affront that Khrushchev had made by suggesting that the USSR put submarines in Chinese waters that we discussed earlier, Mao decided to keep his plans to launch an attack on Taiwan a secret. So, after they had finished paddling around in their swimming pool, Mao waited three weeks after Khrushchev had returned back home to launch a bombardment on the island of Kimoi on August 23rd, 1958. Kimoi, also known as Jinmen or Kinmen, is a county of the Republic of China. It's a small island in the Taiwan Strait that's located much closer to the mainland, about 10 kilometers, than it is to any part of Taiwan proper, about 187 kilometers. The island remained a nationalist stronghold after the Civil War, however, and had around 80,000 nationalist troops and 40,000 civilians living there in 1958. Attempts at bombarding the island by the PRC in 1954 and 1955 had been met with threats of nuclear warfare by the US. For some reason, however, Mao had thought that this particular bombardment on Jinmen in 1958 would not lead to direct military response from the US, but rather just a threat followed by the possibility of reopening diplomatic talks. That illusion was quickly dispelled, when on August 25th, the Americans launched a fleet into the strait and ordered them to enter the three-mile limit considered Chinese waters, if necessary. Mao was taken aback and called a ceasefire on September 3rd, after which the Americans reiterated again that they would be willing to engage in nuclear warfare if necessary. The shelling of Kamoi had come as a complete surprise to the Soviet Union. Mao skirted around the issue of not informing the Soviet Union before launching the attack by framing it as an internal affair, which was more than disingenuous, and seems to have been more of an excuse than anything else. He certainly used domestic politics to support the attack, however. By this time, the Great Leap Forward had been launched, and commune formation was well underway. Reports of the bombing of Jinmen were used to whip up even more support for the domestic transformation. Here was the PRC, giving the rest of the world a good show of force abroad and defending its international interests. Now the people of China would be even more determined to defend their interests at home and strengthen the country further through their own hard work and determination. Of course, this perception of the bombing as purely an internal affair was completely inaccurate. There was no way that Chinese attacks on Taiwan would not involve US-Soviet relations on some level, as the superpowers were the respective supporters of both sides, and represented the major nexus of international relations during the Cold War period in general. In the end, Mao did send a formal notice, letting Moscow know about the developments on September 4th, so after he had called the ceasefire, at which point Khrushchev sent their foreign minister, Gromyuko, to Beijing. At that point, Zhou Enlai seemingly tried to convince him that all-out nuclear warfare was actually a really good idea, to which Gromio responded that no, it was not, and then he sent a letter to Eisenhower stating that although the US was in the wrong for stoking tensions in East Asia, they should perhaps try and avoid nuclear warfare, just unilaterally. Ambassadorial talks between the US and USSR picked up in Warsaw on September 15th, where they proceeded to talk about nuclear disarmament and also what to do about the Far East. Apparently, China wasn't happy with the idea of the demilitarization of Jinmen, as he saw this as the US trying to permanently separate the two parts of the PRC from each other. They were equally unhappy with Soviet offers to send troops to help with the issue. Nothing about resolving the issue seemed to make Mao happy, 
Uh, he just wanted to control the whole state of affairs and have things play out entirely as he had pictured them in his head, essentially. This obviously overlooked the Soviet position. Apparently, Khrushchev was furious with the position that he'd been put in by the Chinese actions, and these tensions eventually led him to decide to call off the nuclear arms deal that he'd promised back in 1957. But that doesn't happen for a little while yet. Okay, so that's the end of 1958. Yes, I know it's a lot to take in, but just bear with me, we're only doing one more year this episode. So in general, I think 1958 can be seen as the sort of beginning of Chinese domestic politics interfering with international relations, especially when the Soviet Union has its own international sort of 3D chessboard going on where it's trying to do a rapprochement, it's trying to prevent nuclear warfare to all intents and purposes. And generally speaking, Khrushchev is trying to bring the Soviet Union out of isolation and elevate himself as more of a statesman, someone who is on par with uh, the US president. And this is something that we're definitely going to see more of in 1959 especially. So essentially what we're seeing is the beginning of the clash of Chinese domestic politics with Soviet international relations. So, moving swiftly on to 1959. This year saw the continuation of the old tensions, further inflamed by a series of international conflicts that actually on the surface had nothing to do with Sino-Soviet relations, but in reality just served to further the ideological divide between the two. The overarching problem continued to be China's domestic politics in the form of the Great Leap Forward. So as we know from the four-part series that we just did on the Great Leap Forward, Prior to the Lushan Conference in 1959, Mao had been willing to make changes to the Great Leap policies and had been open to criticism from his fellow party members on how to correct the path and rein in some of the radicalization among lower party cadres. This openness extended to their discussion of the issue with the Soviet ambassador in China in early 1959. The ambassador at that time was a man called Yudin. Moscow didn't know that China was going through economic collapse and famine in 1958 due to China's pulling away and isolating the Soviet embassy. But by early 1959, it seemed that the faltering economy had helped the Chinese leadership come around on the idea that the Soviet Union really was the leader in the communist world, and they became a little bit more willing to be open about the fact that China was facing what could only be described as an imminent disaster. After the 21st CPSU Congress in 1959, top Chinese leaders such as Zhou Enlai had admitted to the Soviet ambassador Yudin that China was experiencing grain shortages, though he mainly pinned the blame on poor spring harvests due to bad weather. Liu Xiaoqi had also told him that the boom in the industrial sector had caused the urban population to explode far too quickly for them to handle and had put further strain on grain supplies. Though they didn't talk about the famines directly, before mid-1959, the Chinese leadership were willing to be more upfront with the Soviet Union about economic failures they were facing due to their commune experimentation, which, again, the Soviet Union had explicitly warned them against. So, unfortunately, this open attitude switched completely after the July 1959 Lushan Conference the one where Peng Dehuai had written a letter to Mao criticising the excesses of the leap, which Mao had taken personally. In the ensuing anti-rightist purge, which we discussed a bit in the previous episodes on the Great Leap, he accused Peng of collaborating with Khrushchev to withdraw Soviet support and created a really elaborate conspiracy in which both domestic and international actors were basically trying to displace him and oust him from power. This perception was not helped by the withdrawal of the Soviet Union's promise to deliver a Model A bomb to China in June of 1959. While the Soviets had given the excuse that they felt the Chinese just weren't ready for nuclear weapons, their internal explanations seemed to show that they actually just didn't want to give the US an excuse to arm West Germany with similar weapons, which would pose a much more direct threat to the USSR. Of course, the decision had probably also been exacerbated by the Taiwanese Strait Crisis, 
as the Soviets were increasingly annoyed by China's attempts to ruin their relationship with the US. Later, when the Soviet Union decided to pull away from China and withdrew their experts from the country, Mao used this to point out that Khrushchev had abandoned the international communist cause to side with the imperialists. I joked at the beginning of the episode that the Sino-Soviet split was a bit like a divorce where no party had really done anything wrong per se, but I guess if we were going to take the analogy all the way, we could say that China basically accused the Soviet Union of adultery. At the end of the Great Leap Forward, Mao and the other CCP leadership continued to promote the idea that the famine had been caused partly by the radical policies, but they laid heavy emphasis on the fact that Soviet support and aid had been withdrawn, which exacerbated the famines. The Soviets were hurt, but not surprised by these accusations. A line from Khrushchev's memoirs reads, quote, the Great Leap Forward and the creation of communes caused a great decline in China's industry and agriculture. It was necessary for Mao to recognise his mistakes, but that was no more possible for him than it was for Stalin. In general, radical domestic policies in China continued to grate against the more moderate direction that the Soviet Union was trying to move in, both at home and internationally. This became more evident throughout 1959, as a number of international incidents involving third parties continued to reveal the rift between the two communist nations. The most important of these was the clash between China and India. In 1954, China and India had come to an agreement known as Pancha Shila, or the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence, which aimed to resolve issues surrounding territorial claims over border regions in Tibet and strengthen the economic relationship between the two countries. The five agreements, which stressed non-interference and peaceful coexistence, effectively ended Indian claims to Tibet. However, things began to go wrong when rumours that Beijing was planning on kidnapping the Dalai Lama led to a rebellion in Lhasa in March 1959, during which the Dalai Lama fled to India. I do not know where the rumours came from, by the way. I couldn't really find out any more details about that. I also couldn't verify whether or not it was true, whether they were planning to kidnap him. But anyway. The PLA launched a suppression campaign, while the CCP announced that the Dalai Lama had been actually kidnapped by Tibetan rebels. The situation put Prime Minister Nehru in a difficult position. While he allowed the Dalai Lama asylum in India, he refused to meet with him for fear of disrupting Sino-Indian relations. Old political ruptures over India's Tibet policy reopened. Anti-China politicians favoured military actions in Tibet and questioned Nehru's policy of non-interference. Against the backdrop of increased anti-Nehru propaganda, Mao ordered troops to the border with India in Tibet, known as the McMahon Line, in April, and India soon followed suit. Clashes between the two border controls morphed into full-scale border conflict by September. Now again, on the surface, this doesn't seem to have anything to do with Sino-Soviet relations, but because of the Soviet Union's leading role in the communist world, of course, it comes into play. So if China had actually expected the Soviet Union to support them in this issue, they were just completely out of luck there. Despite India's policy of non-alignment, they had actually become much closer with the USSR after an exchange of visits by top leadership in 1955. The bond was made tighter by the US's support of Pakistan, which was India's enemy, as an attempt to halt the spread of communism in the region, as well as an industrial credit agreement extended by the USSR to India, totaling around 375 million US dollars. As a result, the Soviet Union decided to take a neutral stance on the issue of Tibet, affirming China's claim to the region, but refusing to give credence to the idea that India may have played a role in starting the Tibetan revolt, or that Nehru was trying to weaponize religious tensions to turn Tibet into a buffer zone. They also dismissed claims that it was India who had started the border conflict in the first place, citing China's hostile propaganda campaign as well as their failure to alert the Soviet Union as to what was going on, while India had remained open and forthcoming throughout the situation. They basically called China's bluff. In 
The Soviet Union's declaration of neutrality was a slap in the face to China, who felt that they had picked India and the US over them, and that the Soviet Union was actively distancing itself from China. This perception was worsened by active attempts by the Soviet Union to develop a rapprochement with the US in late 1959. Khrushchev's visit to the US in September 1959 irritated Mao, who didn't understand why the Soviet leader was so keen to impress what he saw as a blustering imperialist state and its weak leader Eisenhower. He felt that the capitalist world was bound to collapse into warfare based on the internal contradictions and competing interests of Western nations. China was further unimpressed by Khrushchev's inability to make any headway during his talks with Eisenhower, though Khrushchev just seemed to be happy that he was being recognised as an international leader. When Khrushchev visited Beijing in October to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the founding of the PRC, He annoyed Mao by talking positively about his trip to the US and by trying to convince him to back down over Taiwan. When Khrushchev tried to push China to appease India, relations soured even further, with the Chinese accusing the Soviets of being revisionists and trying to hurt China by being partial to their enemies. Talks ended on a bitter note, and while the propaganda from the PRC continued to support Khrushchev's attempts at détente with the West openly, It was clear to any who observed the two leaders interacting with each other that relations between the two countries were going nowhere but down. So 1959 showed that the cracks between these two countries were becoming more and more apparent, and Mao harboured beliefs that not only did Khrushchev not really understand Marx's Leninism, but that he'd given up on it altogether to pursue relations with the imperialists. The Soviets, meanwhile, had not appreciated Chinese attempts to ruin its own international relations. Behind closed doors, critiques of Mao's personality cult and the Great Leap Forward were rife, and comparisons with the Stalin regime, which the Soviet Union was trying so hard to distance itself from, only served to further drive a wedge between the two countries. 1959 proved to be a crucial turning point in Sino-Soviet relations, which would only continue to spiral in a downwards direction in the following four years. So that's it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. The next episode will be covering the last four years of the Sino-Soviet split. This episode, I hope, gave you most of the context that you needed and also most of the mindset and the personality difference between Mao and Khrushchev which just becomes more and more important as the years go on. Don't forget that you can sign up for the Sinobabble newsletter by going to Substack and searching for Sinobabble, or by going to the sinobabble.com website and signing up there. You can also donate to support the podcast by going to the Sinobabble website and clicking on the donate button, where you can give a one-off or a monthly donation. And you can also find me on Twitter. I'm trying to use it a little bit more to share interesting things about China. And I'm also doing a weekly newsletter now. Uh, One week will just be news stories about China that you can read about if you're interested in them. Thanks so much for listening. And I hope you tune in next time. Bye.